Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Napoleon's first campaign, the bridge at Arcalay. Last time we saw Napoleon thwart the Austrian effort to relieve the fortress city of Mantua, but he hasn't quite managed to break the city yet. The siege continues. I'm really excited to see what Napoleon gets up to this time. Now, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and will give you access to regular exclusive content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. An Epic History TV PMF Productions collaboration. In 1796, at the height of the French Revolutionary Wars, a young French general took charge of a ragged, demoralized army in northern Italy. It was his first command. <laughs> Many expected him to fail. You know, even at this point, it feels a little nostalgic to look back on this introduction, because, as we've seen in this series, Napoleon has already achieved great things. Now, he's got a long, long way to go before he becomes the famous Napoleon that we all know, but even at this early point in his career, he has very much surpassed his origins. Instead, in just one month, he won his first brilliant campaign. With astonishing self-confidence, boldness, and energy, <laughs> He yeah. led his army to victory after victory, transforming the war in Europe, winning praise from a great- I mean, truly astonishing self-confidence. Self-confidence that may have appeared even a little bit delusional at some point, but hey, when you have that level of cockiness, it's only delusion until you make it true. <laughs> Napoleon is supremely self-confident, but he proves himself over and over and over again. For Republic, and forging a legend. This is the story of Napoleon Bonaparte's first campaign. Yes. And the dawn of a new age. Great. I'm excited. Let's get into part four of the Bridget Arcolay. October 1796. Six months have passed since General Napoleon Bonaparte took command of the French Army of Italy. In that time, he's led a series of brilliant operations against the Austrians, and won a string of battles. Now he appears close to final victory. He's driven Austrian field forces off the plains of northern Italy, back towards the Alps. While his troops have the great fortress city of Mantua, the key to Italy, under close siege, and that's been the target this entire time. It's pretty really remarkable that Mantua hasn't yet fallen, but Napoleon has it, you know? It's been a thorn in his side this entire time. Like Epic History TV says, the key to North Italy, the key to basically Austrian-dominated Italy, Napoleon hasn't quite cracked it, but he's got it under siege. He's pushed these other Austrian armies away, it looks like he's got a real path to victory at this point. Mantua's oversized Austrian garrison is nearing starvation yeah. and riddled with disease. And it only got worse last time. I mean, Wurmser and his men, there's this whole Austrian relief effort. But because Napoleon defeated them and pushed them back, they were forced to retreat into the city, which only increased the burden on Mantua's resources. Napoleon appeals to its commander, Field Marshal von Wurmser, to surrender. The brave should be facing danger, not swamp plague, mm. he jibes. But Wurmser is a tough old veteran. <laughs> he will not yield while any glimmer of hope remains. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we take a look at the opponents Napoleon was facing at this time. And there's a lot of criticism thrown their way, which I think is absolutely appropriate. Wurmser has made a lot of mistakes, but he is a, a tough old nut to crack. He does want to keep fighting, keep going. And I think, once again, none of these guys really measure up to Napoleon, but I think Wurmser has been a fairly formidable foe, or at the very least, he's not a pushover. Sometimes when you get a summary of these early days of Napoleon's career, you get the impression that, yeah, it was Napoleon versus a bunch of Austrian pushovers, but 
That's not the case, as we've seen. A lot of mistakes <laughs> have been made from the Austrian side. That is undeniable, but they have been putting up a fight. And he knows that to the north, Austria is gathering fresh troops to march to his aid. Yep. True, many are Grenz battalions, a type of Habsburg frontier militia, poorly drilled and short of officers. But they help raise the strength of the Austrian field army to 44,000. Wow. And they have a new general to lead them. Feldzeugmeister, or Lieutenant General, Josef Alvinci. The 61-year-old Hungarian was once military tutor to Emperor Francis himself, mm. and is regarded as diligent, sharp, and brave. All right, and we were introduced to Alvinci at the end of last time's episode. Here, we are introduced to Napoleon's next foe. It's kind of funny how this series goes. It's a bit of, you know, Monster of the Week format, where we're following our protagonist, Napoleon, seems like every new video there's a new big bad enemy for him to fight and defeat Alvinci, he's the next guy he and his staff draw up plans for a fresh offensive to rescue Wormser and Mantua Alvinci and Kostanovich will lead the main column 26,000 strong from Friuli to Bassano then onwards to Mantua mm. Davidovich's corps, reinforced to 18,000, will retake Trento and push south through the Adige Valley. The two forces will link up at the earliest opportunity. All right. And to be honest, this is different than the plan we saw last time, but the Austrians have the same basic goal, which is to relieve Mantua. Not too much changed. The situation's gotten a little bit worse, <laughs> more desperate, and the Austrians have raised some more men, but same essential goal, a bit of a different approach, of course. Meanwhile, Wormser, who can muster just 12,000 fit men from the Mantua garrison, will launch powerful sorties to pin down as many French units as possible. Hmm. Napoleon, by contrast, has received very few reinforcements from France. Yeah. His weary divisions are suffering from shortages and sickness. I mean, we've seen this the entire time. Think about when Napoleon arrived to Italy. We're really dealing with quite the underdog story. I mean, first off, most people didn't expect much of Napoleon, but he was dealing with an army that was undersupplied, undertrained. It really wasn't ready for this type of combat. Now, Napoleon did have a lot of hardened veterans under his belt. A lot of these men had combat experience, but resources were very, very low from the beginning, and that situation has not improved much. Now, through Napoleon's own conquests, <laughs> he's actually been able to gather some resources, some money, and supply his own army a little bit, which he's not supposed to be doing. That is expressly against the orders of the French government, but... As we're seeing throughout this entire campaign, Napoleon has not been well supplied at all by the French government, in part because, you know, this is just one theater of many. The French government has other theaters to worry about, and also they don't really consider Italy the main or most important theater of the war. So they're more likely to devote resources to their armies along the Rhine instead of to Napoleon down in Italy. And will be outnumbered on every front. Uh-oh. Alvinci begins his advance on the 22nd of October. The following day, the heavens open, drenching troops, swelling rivers, and reducing roads to mud. Mm. For the time being, Napoleon is content to observe the enemy struggle forward in such <laughs> conditions, knowing the effort will exhaust his infantry and disrupt supplies. On the 2nd of November, fighting breaks out north of Trento, where Napoleon has ordered Vaubois to attack. He wants to keep Davidovich bottled up, but Vaubois is heavily outnumbered, and his attack fails. Vaubois begins pulling back to Caliano, while Massena gives up Bassano and withdraws towards Vicenza. 
And these are the sort of issues that Napoleon has been dealing with this whole time. And first off, he's undersupplied. Second off, he's undermanned. Third off, he can't be everywhere at once. And so he has to send out his subordinates to do the work. Now, of course, the question always pops up, if Napoleon was there, could the situation have been different? It's not even really a worthwhile question because he can't be there. He can't be everywhere at once, but also he really can't resist this onslaught coming from every direction with his lack of manpower and resources. So Napoleon has to be quick on his feet. He has to be willing to adapt, change his strategy, and so far, that's what's kept him alive. That's what's kept him winning. Let's see if he can do it again. <laughs> but now, Alvinci's advance becomes strung out, slowed by the heavy rain and poor fitness of his recruits. Hmm. And it is against Napoleon's nature to remain passive for so oh, yeah. long. Oh yeah. As the Austrians cross the Brenta, he orders Massena to attack General Lipte's division at Fontaniva, while Augereau attacks Hohenzollern at Bassano. It is absolutely against Napoleon's nature to just sit still and watch the enemy. Even if that might be an advantageous move, Napoleon wants to get in there. He wants to take advantage of the discomfort of his opponent. And also, I talk about subordinates. You know, we see guys like Ogero and Messina. Napoleon has a pretty talented crew at this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, some of these guys won't make it. Some of these guys will serve throughout the entirety or most of the Napoleonic Wars, and their service record will be a little up and down. I'm pointing to Messina. He'll be better at some times than others. But during this campaign, Messina is truly a reliable man, one of Napoleon's best. And Napoleon does absolutely have subordinates he can rely on. That is a key aspect of Napoleon's success in Italy and beyond. The French launched dozens of separate assaults. But for all their poor march discipline, the Austrian recruits stand their ground and all fight right. hard. Fair. With around 3,000 casualties on each side, the Second Battle of Bassano is the bloodiest day's fighting so far in the Italian campaign. And a failure for Napoleon. Hours later, he receives dire news from uh -oh. Vaubois. During heavy fighting at Caliano, some Croatian troops get behind the French line, triggering panic and a rout. Vaubois loses nearly half his division, killed, wounded, or missing, oh. before he can regroup at Rivoli. I mean, look, we're seeing big casualties on either side, and that has been pretty characteristic of this campaign. But that is a big, big loss for the French. We've seen that the Austrians are doing a better job <laughs> at resupplying and sending more men in. They do technically outnumber Napoleon on all fronts. And so those losses, Napoleon really can't handle them. And we can see he's sort of struggling to keep up in every direction. Or at the very least, his subordinates are struggling to handle all of these different attacks Napoleon, or at least the French troops, are sort of being pushed back from every direction. Napoleon's in a real dangerous spot at the moment. The French are falling back on all fronts. Yeah. And unless Napoleon can conjure something remarkable, he seems destined to suffer a major strategic defeat. Oh, isn't that always the case? <laughs> we watch these videos, you know, it seems like in every video or every other video, Napoleon's in a terrible position, and we say, unless he can do something truly remarkable, he's not going to make it out of this. Well, you know, he's done it before. I reckon he can do it again. This video is sponsored by G2A, oh. the online marketplace for all your digital products. Now, this is a new video, so I'll let the ad play through. Uh, I just want to make the point, you know, I have their video linked down below, so please go and check out this video from Epic History TV. Go give them a like. Uh, go check out their ad. Show them support for making these truly fantastic, fantastic videos, but I'm going to let the ad play through. Feeling more nostalgic? Classic strategy titles such as Civ 6 or Hearts of Iron 4 can be picked up for a fraction of their usual price. 
Oh. G2A is very much the Amazon for digital products, with multiple sellers clearly rated by fellow shoppers for their customer service. There's something for everyone at G2A. And by using our referral link in the video description, you'll be supporting Epic History TV. Thanks again to G2A for supporting this video. What an interesting ad. G2A ad on a history video. <laughs> Soldiers! I'm not satisfied with you. You abandoned yourselves to panic. You were driven from positions where a handful of brave men might have stopped an army. Let it be inscribed on their colors. They are no longer part of the army of Italy. My goodness, so we see Napoleon clearly a little bit upset, and you can understand why, but also trying to whip his men into shape, whip him into action, saying, hey, you know, me, Napoleon, who his men have gained a lot of respect for him at this point due to all of the success he's given them, he's saying, I'm not pleased with your performance. You guys need to shape up, you know, you can't abandon yourself to panic, you can't retreat. We need to stand firm, you know? Like, come on, let's keep going. We are the army of Italy, basically. And what we do is we stand firm and we keep pushing, trying to inspire his men through a, a bit of shame. Napoleon's position is perilous, but his enemy's cautious pursuit affords him some respite. Four whole days pass while Alvinci and Davidovich coordinate their next moves. Mm. It's not a delay Napoleon would have tolerated if the shoe had been on the other foot. <laughs> when the Austrians finally advance, it's bungled. Hohenzollern's vanguard approaches Verona to investigate reports of a French retreat. I mean, look, even when the Austrians are performing well, the Austrians are pushing back. I think what we've learned is that, first off, their men really cannot compare to the army of Italy, especially in this case. Like they said, we have a lot of basically frontier militiamen. They just don't have the same level of discipline or experience as a lot of Napoleon's veterans do. And then even when the Austrians are pushing forward and finding success, they just do not have even close to the same amount of organization and discipline that Napoleon does. I mean, he is really fantastic at keeping his men together, moving quickly, acting decisively. And this is something that the Austrians have really, really struggled to do. This isolated division is too tempting for Napoleon to ignore. <laughs> he orders Augereau and Massena to attack. They inflict 400 casualties, but Hohenzollern escapes to a ridge near Caldiero. Mm. The next day, Napoleon orders renewed attacks. But conditions are atrocious. The French struggle uphill into driving rain and hail, their boots slipping in the mud under fire from Austrians dug in on the ridge top. Around noon, Colonel Dupuy's 32nd Demi Brigade finally gets onto the ridge. It looks like the French may be able to lever the Austrians out of their position. Mm. But then, the Austrian army begins to arrive in force to support Hohenzollern's hard-pressed division. Yep. There you go. And I think, honestly, in this video, we're going to see uh, Napoleon struggling a little bit. Now, he's still Napoleon, absolutely, but he's in a pretty tough position here. He's facing some pretty stiff resistance from the Austrians, and frankly, a pretty stiff offensive from the Austrians. The French are in danger of being outflanked on both wings. Yeah. They take up new defensive positions and hold the line until darkness, when Napoleon cuts his losses and orders a retreat to Verona. It has been an unequivocal French defeat. Napoleon's first in battle. There you go. We see Napoleon suffer a loss. And, you know, I say in this video we're going to see Napoleon struggling a little bit. That doesn't necessarily refer to losses. <laughs> you can struggle to, uh, you can struggle towards victory or struggle in victory. But here we have a loss from Napoleon, the Wonder Child. 
You know, he's been pushing the Austrians around northern Italy so deftly. And here we have this. Is it over? Well, don't get hyperbolic. Of course not. But uh, this is uh, pretty bad. The following day, he writes furiously to the directory in Paris. He has no doubt that they are to blame for his defeat, <laughs> for repeatedly failing to send reinforcements. And what I will say is that, I mean, Napoleon is extremely egotistical. He is the kind of guy who does like to find a scapegoat when something goes wrong. But, in this case, you gotta sympathize with the guy. You know what I mean? Uh, he has really been performing wondrously, fantastically, and he has been so badly undersupplied by the French government, you can't blame him for turning back to the government and saying, Hey, you know, I just lost this battle. Thanks a lot to you guys. I mean, I'm so undersupplied and undermanned. How am I supposed to keep up these victories? So I totally understand where he's coming from. We may be on the verge of losing Italy. None of the expected help has arrived. Mm. The army of Italy, reduced to a handful of men, is worn out. Although this was Napoleon's favorite thing to do. Remember, this is a very intelligent man, a pretty good writer at that. First off, he knows how to pander to the public, and he also tries his best to pander to the government. So if you look at a lot of Napoleon writing back to the government, he will, of course, emphasize the victories, always emphasize the victories, emphasize his skill and the discipline of his men. But alongside that, even when he is victorious, Napoleon will always add in, you know, but we are close to defeat, or we can't make it much further, or we need more support to keep winning. Napoleon, you know, always liked to emphasize those two things at once. And, you know, here we have a situation, though, where he truly has faced a defeat, and things are starting to look pretty damn risky. So you know he's going to write back to the government and be like, hey, <laughs> we need help. We cannot keep going like this. The heroes of Lodi, Millesimo, Castiglione, and Bassano have died for their country or are in the hospitals. The men have nothing left but their reputation and their pride. We are abandoned in the depths of Italy. Mm. But despite his apparent despair, Napoleon has already devised a plan to strike back. Oh, well, of course. This is why I say he would always write to the government in a particular way. He was an intelligent guy. Napoleon is not writing his genuine heartfelt feelings back to the directory. This isn't a diary. He's trying to get something for them from them. That's why I emphasize, even when Napoleon was victorious, he would always write back to the government, trying to boost his reputation, but also trying to make them send him supplies. No, Napoleon doesn't actually believe that He's lost and all has gone to shit. He might be telling the government that. He's emphasizing the negative aspects. But, you know, Napoleon himself, he's got confidence he can win. He's got a plan. A breathtakingly bold move that will spawn one of the greatest of Napoleonic legends. That is true. <laughs> I mean, you don't need me to tell you, but that is absolutely true. Uh, in a few days, we will try one last effort. If fortune smiles upon us, Mantua will be taken, and with it, Italy. And this is Napoleon with the writing Austrians to the Directory. Converging on Verona, Napoleon decides to risk everything on a daring surprise attack. Leaving Macard to cover Verona, he will circle south with the rest of the army, cross the Adige River, and swing north threatening to cut Alvinci's lines of communication. And, and he really is risking everything. And this, it's a really interesting thing. It gives us a really good look at Napoleon and also a good look at how Napoleon is just so different from the tactics of old, from all of these generals that he's facing. You know, it's not like Napoleon is commanding a small number of men. He is commanding a pretty significantly sized army here. And yet, he maneuvers like he's in control of a much smaller force. Like I said earlier, extremely decisive. He moves extremely quickly, and he also takes a lot of risks. I mean, Napoleon is really characterized throughout his entire career by his risk-taking. Now, the thing that makes Napoleon great is that when he takes those risks, he's usually correct, but they are risks nonetheless. 
And so you can see he is in a pretty bad situation at this point. Any other general at this point, really any other prominent general, would play it so much more cautiously, would be moving back, pulling back, consolidating his position. Not Napoleon. And this is why Napoleon is different. And, you know, the European military community is still just not ready, not used to Napoleon. He's going to wheel all the way around in this extremely risky, daring move, which frankly may seem a little bit crazy if it wasn't coming from Napoleon, who we know, you know, loves to do this sort of stuff. He's really staking it all on the success of this move. It's really pretty difficult to overemphasize how incredibly risky this is and how much skill, discipline, and organization a move like this will take. And capture his artillery, baggage, and supplies. Such losses will force Alvinci to abandon his advance. Marching overnight, Augereau and Massena arrive undetected at Ronco. Augereau's men cross the Adige on a pontoon bridge and begin moving north. But with marshland on all sides, they have to stick to the narrow, raised causeway just 20 yards wide. And when they reach Arcole, where they must cross the bridge to continue north, they find it held by two Croatian battalions. And, of course, y'all know something's coming because, <laughs> you know, the video's titled The Bridge at Arcole. Stuff's really about to go down. Horribly exposed on the causeway and under heavy fire, the French troops take cover behind its reverse slope. Yeah, this is a real difficult way to start. So they're trying to quickly, but also sneakily, make their way, uh, you know, across the bridge to Arcole. Unfortunately, they find it's occupied, and the bridge is held, and these French soldiers find themselves very exposed in a real bad position. <laughs> so, you know, we're starting off this daring move by Napoleon, and already it is not going nearly as smoothly as he would have liked. In fact, I would say the whole operation is at risk. Reinforcements are sent up, but they too are pinned down by the weight of fire from the far bank. Colonel Lan had discharged himself from hospital that morning <laughs> in order not to miss the battle. Yep. He now attempts to lead a charge, but is hit in the leg. Yeah. The fiery Ogero refuses to accept defeat and orders another attack. And you gotta love all these fellas serving under Napoleon. They really have that fiery spirit of determination within them, as Napoleon does. Very typical of Land to keep moving forward, even if uh, he ends up injured at the end. Uh, you know, the fiery, determined Ogero absolutely refuses to draw back from this. You know, just all these characters who are just on the same page. And we've talked about in earlier episodes and throughout Epic History TV's Napoleon series how the French Revolution and the Revolutionary Wars really did a good job at promoting these sort of ambitious young fellas, uh, mainly because a lot of the older cautious guys either died, fled, or were executed. <laughs> so, you know, the result of that is there's a lot of open positions, and if you're an ambitious, fiery young man, you can work your way up a little easier. So we see a lot of them throughout this conflict. But his men are exhausted and demoralized, with three generals wounded. Yeah. The attack at Arcole has stalled. Yeah. When Alvinci hit... And uh, once again, I gotta emphasize just how bad that is. You know, I just talked about how much of a risky operation this is, how much skill, organization it takes. It really can't be stalled. You cannot afford to wait. This operation relies on speed and surprise. And so Napoleon needs things to move smoothly. He needs to keep going. He cannot afford to be stalled for a significant period of time. That would be a disaster. Or if he is stalled for a significant period of time, one might say to Napoleon, hey, maybe you uh, sort of reconfigure this plan, try something else. Basically, you're encountering a big problem here. Here's gunfire from the south. He assumes the French are making a feint to divert him from his own planned attack on Verona. Mm. 
But then comes alarming news that the French have crossed the Adige <laughs> in force and are behind his left flank. Yeah. He sends two brigades to attack the French bridgehead and diverts Mitrovsky to reinforce Arkele. Masena's division, moving northwest to protect the flank of the advance, runs straight into the Austrians. So now, not only are the French struggling to cross the bridge at Arkele, but now they're being attacked from several different directions. Basically, the Austrians are now closing in from the north. Uh-oh, this is not going well. Beyond day. At first, the Austrians have the better of it. But a disastrous friendly fire incident triggers panic. Ooh. And Masena drives the Austrians back up the causeway. That's very either unlucky or very badly planned. Basically, extremely unfortunate for the Austrian force. Napoleon is increasingly concerned by the holdup at Arkele. As he should be. <laughs> if they cannot break through, Alvinci will have ample time to redeploy and prevent any advance. He now orders General Gear to take two regiments, cross the Adige at Albaredo, and lead them up the eastern bank of the Alpone River. All right, trying sort of a different approach. I mean, clearly Napoleon realizes how important it is to get across this damn bridge. And so he's like, okay, why don't we try crossing a little further south? <laughs> we need to get across this river. To hit Arcole from the south. He himself rides to the bridge to try to get the attack moving. Yes, and what we're about to see will become a very famous moment in the biography of Napoleon. He finds hundreds of French troops sheltering behind the causeway, unwilling to face the Austrian fire. And I will say, keep in mind the situation they're facing. They have very little cover at the moment, and what Napoleon wants them to do is to rush across this bridge, facing withering fire from the Austrians, both on the other side of the river and the Austrians who hold the bridge. I mean, this is basically a suicide mission for several rows deep of men. I mean, it is an absolutely terrifying, uh, and frankly, for an individual, irrational thing to do. You know, you really would have to truly commit yourself to the cause to be able to, with all your comrades, charge this bridge. Uh, it is just something against human nature to run straight into the face of death, knowing that that's what's going to happen. Many of you are going to die before you're able to hold this bridge and then cross. General Augereau grabs a standard and begins to advance. This highly romanticized depiction was painted two years later. Mm. Grenadiers, he cries, come and seek your color. In reality, none had the courage to follow him. Yeah. Then, the commander of the Army of Italy himself draws his saber, picks up a standard, and runs forward. There is withering fire all around. Several men fall wounded. His aide-de-camp, Colonel Mouron, is killed. Yeah. Another aide-de-camp, a Polish officer named Sulkowski, recalls, the soldiers saw him and none of them imitated him. I was witness to this extraordinary cowardice and I cannot conceive it. And so you might be wondering, first off, why is this something that has become famous in Napoleon's biography? That's what I mentioned earlier. This is a famous part of Napoleonic history. And also, what exactly happened here? So I'll lay it out for you. Basically, we're facing the situation as presented. You know, we have this sort of stalemate. The Austrians are holding Arcole, they're holding the bridge, and the French just cannot advance forward for the reasons I just discussed. You know, they're... Napoleon and his officers are trying to encourage these men to get up, put their lives on the line, and charge towards this bridge. So, in sort of a desperate attempt, what Napoleon does is grabs a flag <laughs> and starts sprinting towards the bridge. This is extremely, extremely dangerous. Gunfire whizzing around him. Remarkably, he does not get shot. 
what happens is that one of his aides basically tackles Napoleon into a ditch <laughs> before he can reach the bridge and get himself killed. Now, of course, there's the question of would Napoleon have actually, like, run onto the bridge? I mean, he would have certainly gotten himself killed. Was he committed? Or is this one of those things where, you know, you're about to get into a fight and you say to your buddy, hey, hold me back, but you don't really have any intention of fighting? We don't know. What we do know is that, hey, Napoleon really did grab that flag and go for the bridge, and then he was prevented from doing so. And like they mentioned, uh, many of Napoleon's men, uh, one aide-de-camp in particular, you know, were shot uh, and were killed during this uh, instant. Extremely, extremely dangerous. And so that's what happened. And so now to why did this end up being a famous moment? I mean, Napoleon failed. You know, he tried to inspire his men, lead them forward, and he failed. This became a very, very romanticized moment in the history of this conflict. And with a little bit of twisting, I'm sure you can imagine why. Napoleon, this great general, the commander of the army, grabbing a flag and heroically leading his men onto the bridge. When you put it like that, it sounds pretty nice. And so a lot has been written about this. There have been several famous paintings of this moment, of course, very generously interpreted. And some of you have probably seen a couple of these paintings because, like I said, they're very famous paintings. Uh, maybe some of the first paintings you might think of when you think of Napoleon. And so this was a moment that was very propagandized. Battle of Arcole became known throughout France. Uh, it really boosted Napoleon's reputation, even though when we look at this moment in particular, it was actually a failure. You know, Napoleon actually couldn't convince his men to follow. That is not how it has been remembered. And so that's why it became this sort of legendary moment in Napoleon's career. Very interesting, and this is what actually happened. With the French infantry refusing to follow their officers, the assault on the bridge ends in abject failure. A well-timed Austrian counterattack drives them back down the causeway. In the rout, Napoleon's horse loses its footing. He tumbles into the swamp and has to be hauled out by his aides. Yeah. That it's not a very glamorous moment for Napoleon, and you gotta feel a little bit bad for the guy. I mean, he really is giving it his all. He is trying to personally lead from the front at certain times, and it's not going well. His men aren't following him, the Austrians are pushing back, he's covered in mud at this point. <laughs> I mean, not glamorous for Napoleon, certainly not. This is turning, well, this is turning really sour really quickly. This brilliant, reckless, risky plan that he had, it seems to be falling apart before our eyes. This evening, General Gear launches his attack on Arcole from the south. Hmm. The defenses are less formidable on this side, and his men fight their way into the village. Arcole, at last, has fallen. But that night, Gear's men are ordered to pull back. Napoleon is preparing to retreat. Mm. If, as he expects, Davidovich has continued his advance down the Adige Valley, Napoleon must withdraw now or face encirclement. His bold maneuver appears to have failed. Yeah. And at this point, Napoleon does sort of pull back to that more cautious nature, which most of the generals of this era embraced. You know, maybe acting a little bit unlike himself. Or maybe you could say coming to his senses. I suppose it depends on how you view the situation. Some would argue that he's sort of lost a bit of confidence due to that failure that day. Some would argue, oh, maybe he's just being sensible. But he's basically worried that this plan he's gone through with has left him very vulnerable. And he is in a dangerous situation, which he is. And so he's thinking about sort of reorienting his position. Then, at 4 a.m., Napoleon receives a report from Rivoli that changes everything. Yes, he does. <laughs> Not only does Vaubois still hold the town, he hasn't even been attacked yet. Napoleon's line of retreat remains secure for at least a few days more. 
It's all the reassurance he needs. He immediately cancels his retreat and issues orders to attack. There you go. Day two, we continue the Battle of Arcalay. And once again, as with any famous figure throughout history, there's a lot of speculation about what was going on in Napoleon's head at that moment. What was he thinking? What was he feeling? Uh, we don't truly know. You know, you can't know what's inside somebody's head, but there's a lot of speculation that, you know, Napoleon's emotions might have played a role in his decision-making there. You know, the failure that first day, maybe he'd lost a bit of confidence, just temporarily. He was worried about what was going to happen. He decided to pull back and then he got that news and that sort of shifted his mindset back towards you know, sort of the Napoleon we know, the offensive, the attack, the aggressive Napoleon that we've seen throughout this series and he decided to continue. Once again, you know, this is all speculative. We don't know what was going on inside the man's head, but people think about this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> Napoleon has lost the element of surprise. Yes. <laughs> and Alvinci is now planning his own counterattack. Overnight, his troops edge forward. Provera to Belfiore di Porcile. Mitrovsky back into Arcole. Both armies are on the move before dawn. Massena sends skirmishers into the marshland. When the Austrians arrive, bunched up on the causeway, they make easy targets. Hmm. After a sharp fight in which an Austrian general is killed, Massena's men are driving the enemy before them. Augereau, however, cannot get close to Arcole. Mm. The causeway is still swept by Austrian musket fire and canister. I mean, yet yeah, once again, Arcole remains the issue. Of course, it's unfortunate that Napoleon had tried a different approach the day before and found some success by the end of the day, but it pulled back. But, you know, we're sort of back to step one, right? Napoleon needs to cross this damn bridge or get over to Arcole some way. Take the city, take the town, I should say. It's being very strongly defended by the Austrians. It's a really tough position that he's still in. And, of course, now he's lost that element of surprise completely from across the Alpone. Napoleon orders troops to cross downstream at Albaredo. Right. But the Austrian trying a strategy that had worked, but now the Austrians know what's up. Now have two battalions guarding the crossing point. French attempts to float or swim across the river come to naught. Day two of the battle ends in stalemate. Yeah. Many soldiers have to camp amid the marshes and get what food and rest they can. Mm. Napoleon will try once more to break through. But he is running out of time. Yes, he is. I mean, though he's gotten that news from Rivoli that he may not be under immediate threat, what we talked about earlier in this episode still stands. This is a strategy that does rely on some sort of rapid action. Now, it's already not as rapid as Napoleon would like, and it's not going smoothly, but Napoleon can't risk much more time wasted on trying to take Arcole. He really can't. He needs this to go faster. So he's facing a really tough situation. As we move into day three. Davidovich, who by now has received several urgent requests from Alvinci to advance, finally attacks on the 17th of November. Yep. Vaubois' outgunned division breaks. The Austrians take Rivoli and 1,000 prisoners and nearly capture Vaubois himself. Uh-oh. With Davidovich on the move at last, Napoleon must force a decision at Arcole or retreat. Yep. Cannot afford to wait any longer. The bridge at Arcole has proved too tough to crack. So Napoleon switches tactics. Augereau's division will cross the Alpone and attack Arcole from the south in force. A column is sent 10 miles south to cross at Lenyago, 
and then race back up the eastern bank to support him. Massena will advance up the causeway in support, while also protecting the left flank. Mm -hmm. That night, the French assemble a pontoon bridge over the Alpone. Augereau's division begins crossing before dawn. But at sunrise, Austrian gunners in Alberedo spot the bridge and score uh -oh. a hit, knocking it out of action. Only the 51st Demi Brigade is across, though it gamely begins to advance on Arkeley. <sighs> That's some courage right there, you know? Now, look, uh, Napoleon himself, I'm sure, is upset at a lot of his men <laughs> for not being willing to commit suicide by crossing the bridge at Arkeley, but these are some brave, brave souls right here. They are trying their damnedest. They really are. This is a very difficult situation to be in. You know, the French are feeling very exposed. They are doing all they can, given the situation that Napoleon has put them into. Massena's advance is also hamstrung by a broken pontoon bridge. To add to the crisis, the Austrians launch an attack on the fragile French bridgehead. Hmm. Napoleon gathers every available gun to blast the Austrians, who fall back under a withering barrage. The bridges are quickly repaired. But as the French advance, they encounter stubborn opposition on both sides of the Alpone. And now we can see, in the third day of this battle, everything is sort of mixed up. <laughs> the objectives, it's turned into far more of a direct engagement. Um, Napoleon has attacked from several angles. The Austrians are on both sides of the river, so the, the nature of the engagement has sort of changed at this point. A bloody seesaw battle surges back and forth along the causeways. Neither side can deploy its troops, nor gain an advantage. Around 3 p.m., the French column from Lenyago arrives, threatening to turn the Austrian flank. Just as Arcole seems about to fall, the Austrians launch a ferocious counterattack across the bridge. Brigadier General Robert is killed. Yeah. His troops fall back in disarray. This is a big sort of instantaneous loss and uh, a big loss to the French cause at this very moment. You can imagine how that would be pretty disastrous under a lot of circumstances, including this one. Also, you gotta give credit to these Austrian troops. They are putting up a real tough fight. I mean, they're giving it all they have during this battle, and they've found a lot of success, frankly. The panic is contagious. Augereau's men lose their nerve and fall back to the bridge. There you go. Like I said, a loss like that can be absolutely disastrous to the battle plan and to any momentum that the French might have held. The moment of crisis has arrived. But while the enemy has just used his last reserves, Napoleon can call on Massena's unengaged troops, including the elite 32nd Demi Brigade. Yes. Their sudden counterattack turns the tide. Yeah, saves the day. Really saves the day. <laughs> Massena and his men rushing in from the west really turns this battle around. Absolutely. Massena's men sweep up the causeway, taking scores of prisoners as Augereau's division resumes its advance. As they approach Arcalay, Napoleon arranges a small ruse de guerre. Twenty-five of his elite escort sweep in from the east, blowing bugles to feign a mass cavalry charge. Mm -hmm. In the evening light, it's enough to scare the remaining garrison into abandoning the village. As the French continue their advance, Alvinci orders his exhausted, demoralized army to retreat east. My goodness, everyone, take a breath. <laughs> so, the plan did not work how Napoleon intended it to, but 
<laughs> it has still ended in success, remarkably. I said earlier in this video, when we were talking about Napoleon's first loss of the campaign, that Napoleon would see him struggle a lot throughout this one, and that I wasn't just referring to that loss. I think y'all see what I was referring to. Even in success, there's been a lot of struggle along the way. And now that we're through with the Battle of Arcalay, you know, of course there's been a lot of talk about it, as with everything Napoleon has done. A lot of people... Now, I think this has emerged because, like I said, the Battle of Arcalay will become such a famous legendary conflict, um, really will boost Napoleon's reputation with all the propaganda and the paintings of him leading his men across the bridge and all that sort of stuff that emerged from this. And so there's been a lot of chatter about how this was not necessarily Napoleon's best performance, you know? We see in this, Napoleon was maybe stubborn when he shouldn't have been, and wasn't flexible when he should have been. Now, Napoleon is a stubborn and flexible individual at different times. He usually knows when to apply those traits. And so there have been a lot of arguments made that he really didn't perform his best during this battle. And I think that's probably true, you know? And now remember... We're not comparing Napoleon to everybody else. We're comparing Napoleon to himself, his other victories, his other successes when we say he wasn't performing at his best. Now, this was an extremely, extremely risky move. You, you got to take that into account. And in the end, you know, it ends up working, right? But very reckless and... Napoleon made some mistakes along the way. To Montebello, to protect its lines of communication. The three-day battle of Arcole has been a messy, bloody affair with yeah. no great tactical and, flourishes. Yeah, and they're pointing it out too, so don't just take my word for it, but you can see, of course the Austrians are dealing with higher casualties, but massive casualties for both sides. Once again, the French cannot afford to handle these casualties, and like they said, you know, no great tactical flares. We don't really see during this battle <laughs> a moment where we go, oh, that's Napoleon at its greatest, oh, I didn't expect that, oh, oh, I can't believe Napoleon chose to do that and it worked. That doesn't really happen, you know? Not saying Napoleon completely fell flat, but it doesn't feature some of his typical quick and ingenious thinking. Napoleon's margin of victory is narrow. Yeah. And a third of his army are casualties. But he has done enough. For now. That's key. Enough. It took good luck to defeat Alvinci. Exactly. Napoleon knows it too. <laughs> Alvinci may be withdrawing, but Davidovich remains a threat. Mm -hmm. The next day, Napoleon sets off at his customary pace with Massena's division to reinforce Vaubois. Augereau takes a different route to threaten the Austrians' line of retreat. And I will say, you know, of course you gotta give some credit to Napoleon, always, but uh, even though that was not his best performance, he still has that, you know, customary quickness to how he behaves. So this battle is just finished. Bam, Napoleon's marching west immediately. So even if you might expect more for him in a situation like the battle at Arcole, he doesn't let it keep him down. <laughs> I mean, there was a moment during that battle after the first day when it looked like he would, he might pull back a little bit, but he didn't. He continued moving forward. And now that the battle is over, he has in one way or another achieved what he wanted to achieve. Napoleon keeps going, he keeps moving forward. Now he's going for the next threat. The confusion that follows between Alvinci and Davidovich verges on farce. <laughs> Alvinci writes to his corps commander, informing him that he will support him by resuming his advance. But Davidovich, having heard of the defeat at Arcole and now directly menaced by Napoleon, is already retreating. Mm -hmm. On receiving Alvinci's letter, however, he tries to turn his army around, leading to such chaos that he has to immediately countermand that order and resume his retreat. 
I mean, what a disaster. <laughs> we talk about being stubborn and flexible when you need to be. There are times when you should turn your armory around. There are times when you've made a decision and you need to stick with it. <laughs> this is a good look, once again, at the lack of organization and discipline and leadership in the Austrian army versus with the French, uh, well, with Napoleon in particular. The end result is that both Austrian armies are soon withdrawing. Yep. And with exquisitely poor timing, gallant old <laughs> yeah. Bursa, really the worst of timing, the absolute worst, uses this moment to launch his supporting attack from Mantua. Yeah. He does at least secure some much needed supplies at a cost of 800 casualties. It has been a bruising campaign for Napoleon. Yeah. By some estimates, he has lost more men than the Austrians. Oh my, I mean, look at that. November, one month casualty estimates. Truly, truly devastating. I mean, when we think about the size of the French army, that is truly a massive and devastating loss. And we've talked about how Napoleon needs more manpower. He needs to be resupplied throughout this campaign. He needs it now more than ever. He, uh... He's getting pretty beaten down at this point. Even with all of these victories, some more skillful than others, he's really getting beaten down. He has suffered his first defeat in battle and won a costly, messy victory at Arkham. Yeah, yeah. But he has beaten the odds and thrown back the enemy. What's more, his heroic conduct at the bridge at Arkale mm -hmm. will soon take on a life of its own. Artists and pamphleteers turn a slightly embellished version of events. <laughs> there you go. I'm glad they're pointing this out. Yeah, a slightly embellished version of events. Sure, only slightly. <laughs> into a sensational piece of personal PR that captivates France. Mm -hmm. With Napoleon's active encouragement, the world is witness. And by the way, this is one of those paintings I was talking about uh, based on this event. Many of you are probably familiar with this painting. The birth of the Napoleonic legend. Yes. A powerful force that will inspire loyalty and... And many of you are probably familiar with that one too. <laughs> ...devotion for many years to come. For now, both armies settle into winter quarters as December brings bitter cold and heavy snow to northern Italy. In Mantua, the Austrian garrison is near its limit. Starvation beckons, though Wurmser is determined to hold out to the last. Mm. The Austrians will have one last chance to save the city, a final offensive to decide the outcome of the war in Italy. A big thank you to PMF Productions. For Shout out to PMF Productions. Oh my. Fantastic, fantastic video. Another great one from Epic History TV and PMF Productions. What did you expect? They're just great at this. So, yeah. A lot of stuff happened in this episode. There's a lot to talk about. Um, I think the Battle of Arcalay is one of those really interesting points in Napoleon's career and shows us a lot of things. Also, this video as a whole, sort of this stage of the Italian campaign, like they said, Napoleon ends up victorious, but he loses, you know, he deals with his first loss, and the victory at Arcalay is, like they said, messy, you know, messy, the opposite of smooth, you know, very bumpy, a very bumpy road to victory here, which is... In some ways, a little uncharacteristic of Napoleon. Now, once again, we're comparing Napoleon to himself, and he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, general of all time. So maybe that's not a fair comparison, but uh, we got to look at how he performs in different instances. And, you know, <laughs> he still shows his brilliance here. He shows his quick decision-making, but he sort of lacks a bit of flexibility, I think, at the Battle of Arcalay, which usually Napoleon embraces. Uh, he sort of struggles, I think, to see a different way out of the battle and keeps throwing himself and his men at the problem 
until it is eventually solved, and really only solved by the timely intervention of Messena and his men, which turns the battle around. So there's that. You know, we can learn a bit from that about Napoleon. Um, because it's sort of a, you know, uncharacteristic, unique aspect of Napoleon's legacy. So it's something interesting. Then the other thing we can learn from is how this battle was propagandized. Now this is something that is very characteristic of Napoleon, is very typical. This moment where he leads his men at Arcalay. In reality, like I said, what happens is he picks up a flag, runs at the bridge, and gets tackled into a ditch. <laughs> and his men don't follow. Though the battle ends up being a messy, bloody victory. How this is portrayed back in France, and you saw from all of these paintings and the reports and the articles, you know, the brave young general who's won this laundry list of impressive victories in Italy, picks up the flag and personally leads his men across the bridge. It is an inspiring image and a great piece of propaganda. And Napoleon wins the battle in the end, and he wins the whole campaign, so eh, not many people are going to be asking questions if you say, yeah, this is how it went down. This is how our great general achieved his victory. And you could imagine to a French population that, you know, are maybe getting a little tired of the warfare, um, are getting a little tired of back-and-forth warfare at least. You know, the French have seen a lot of success in the Revolutionary Wars, but they've also seen some failures. And a French population who is really getting tired of its corrupt and opportunistic government a figure like Napoleon, presented in this way, propagandized in this way as this inspiring, patriotic figure, he can be very, very appealing. And Napoleon's image, his base of support, starts to build. Pretty quickly, actually. Though it is an extended process, Napoleon does this on purpose, and he absolutely knows how to take advantage of it. So, some real interesting stuff. A great, great video. Uh, you know, all the stuff I would hope that they would touch on, they did touch on. <laughs> so Epic History TV really never lets you down. Um, great job. Uh, I very much enjoyed this one. If you did, I would appreciate it if you would leave a like on the video and subscribe to my channel. And you can hit that notification button next to the subscribe button, and YouTube will let you know whenever I upload a new video. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, I hope you guys are having a great day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.